Also took some personal sacrifice by a couple of members of our panel, and we appreciate them doing that. As the wheels were set in motion, second Friday of the month is a Mike Carl Partners meeting where they all get together, stack up their cash to see how much more they can accumulate. It's the kind of meeting I like to attend. <laughs> Scrooge McDuck moment. You know. <laughs> and then uh, the turmoil of Michael Heights, nine minutes to seven. I'm sick. I ain't coming in text, which caused Mr. Hornby, as well as a couple other people in our community, to respond to my texts in some form or fashion. We appreciate you driving in early, Mr. Gilstrap, and you driving in period, end of story, Mr. Hornby. Without a shower or electricity. Move closer to your mic. I should not tell you. You own the radio station. I'm not tell you. <laughs> I'm loud enough. Uh, be a telephone, Mr. Joseph Joey Torts Ready, Joe, good to see you or hear you. Rob, uh, we, you and I don't get invited to that one percenter uh, <laughs> breakfast, do we? Don't go crying poor on me for Ready. You retired at the age of 30. <laughs> He's got a second home in Georgia next on the golf course. No, no, his, his second home's in Pocahontas County. The third home's in Georgia. <laughs> Good try, Joe. I, I usually have your back, but I can't on that one. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, we have uh, our uh, Friday Five assembled, and uh, we uh, always start them off with and something. And go a little something like this. <clears throat> Hit it. Uh, get some food. This one's a little longer than usual. Uh, it's a Friday the 13th around this year, Utopia. And if you have a fear of this date, you have Triskaidekaphobia. What a week it has been, as you might have guessed. Thankfully, it's Friday and none of it's left. We had news last Friday of another Martinsburg shooting that chilled. And though three were injured at the football game, fortunately no one was killed. We learned that when Brad Knoll fills in for Larry Schultz, it takes him an hour on Route 9 from the Back Creek Valley. And John Harding can make Italian wedding cookies without any help from his wife Sally. Those were pretty good, don't you think? They were outstanding, yeah. yeah. And when it comes to a third debate and more of that Kamala Harris sauce... President Trump channeled his inner Roberto Duran and proclaimed, No mas. With that as the backdrop, the Friday Five has gathered to inform and to entertain. Some hold them in contempt, others merely disdain. <laughs> Joey Torts returns, calling into us by phone line. If he can't be here in person, his photo will do just fine. Go ahead and slide that over, Colin. That's your cue to slide Joe's photo. There you go. All right. You can bring it back to the Friday Five now. Thank you. Mike Hornby is here, and he's taking Mike Height's place. Height canceled this morning, so Hornby hasn't even had time to wash his face. Mike Carl can't be here. He's knee-deep in his loyally looks, replaced by one John Gilstrap, who killed both me and Mike Height in one of his books. The Admiral is here, fresh from driving some Tesla Road testers. Last week, his day was ruined by mansion following climate protesters. <laughs> <laughs> Larry Schultz is here psyched up by improved Harris ratings and ready to get his rant on loaded with Donald Trump hatings and speaking of Trump and Harris how did you like that debate at the end of your Tuesday by the time it was over I was wishing I could take the place of those dogs and cats as a Haitian entree <laughs> I can't imagine how many tourists are visiting Springfield, Ohio now because of the post-debate buzz, ordering a hot dog, and fearing with each bite that it actually was. <laughs> oh, I knew this was coming. <laughs> the Donald during a debate is always good for some humor, and apparently now also it's spreading an internet rumor. If you stayed up late enough to get to the post-debate night shift, you caught the endorsement of Kamala Harris by one Taylor Swift. Trump also failed to gain another endorsement, but there's no telling which way this group leans from an apparently obscure Haitian organization that favors dog and cat population control by any means. <laughs> the gift that keeps on giving. Got three out of that one. <laughs> 67.1 million people watched the candidates' expressions while the candidates did everything but actually answer the questions. When Vice President Harris was asked about her record at the border and such things, she answered, and I quote, I'm the only person on this stage who has prosecuted transnational criminal organizations for the trafficking of guns, drugs, and human beings. Which begs the response, okay, but maybe if you didn't let them in the country in the first place to perpetuate this insanity... You then wouldn't have to prosecute them for crimes against humanity. 
Seriously, I don't know why we have moderators for a presidential debate. The candidates answer the questions in ways that don't correlate. Maybe Patricia Rucker and John Doyle are onto something, even if it's a bit late. Do away with all those moderators. Increase their unemployment rates. It's not a week in review without a look at the governor, Big Jim. It wouldn't be uh, complete if we didn't talk a little about him. He wants that extra 5% personal income tax cut. But there's a fly in Big Jim's ointment, and it's a pretty big butt. The Senate Finance Chairman is a man named Eric Tarr. And without his approval, Big Jim's plan ain't getting very far. Those two go at it constantly like a big and little brother. As the late Keith Jackson might have said, those two just plain don't like each other. And finally, I leave you with an international rhyme as I see the clock is ticking and I'm nearly out of time. North Korea's Kim Jong-un is once again saber-rattling, launching his missiles and saying things so unflattering. People think he's crazy and that he wants World War III, scaring people across the world by firing missiles that land only in the sea. But what if ending the world isn't actually Kim Jong-un's wish? What if he fires missiles into the sea because he actually hates fish? <laughs> Uh, you, you had way too much time this morning, Rob. <laughs> How late did you stay up last night? <laughs> I told you to grab a snack. That one would take a while. To lead off the program, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Joseph, Joey Toots for ready. You know, I'm wondering, it took Brad Knoll an hour to get to the station from Back Creek Valley. To get from Morgan County and to be at the station on time, Larry Schultz must be sleeping in the radio station parking lot. <laughs> He's not the only yeah. one. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm going to be presenting Mr. Hornby with a giant expenses bill <laughs> uh, for staying in the Motel 6 night after night after night every Thursday. Yeah. That, but you, the, It'll go on page. Just like Rob said. <laughs> Any, <laughs> right. Anyone can turn in an expense report. The key is getting reimbursed. <laughs> We're just documenting it so I can take it off my taxes anyway. <laughs> Understandable. Right. You know, and of course, I, I watch as, as Rob, as you're reading off your rhymes, and, and I can see the look on Hornby's face that he's wondering, gosh, I'm paying for this. <laughs> <laughs> he actually is, yeah. And quite handsome when you're talking, he is. I'm paying, I'm paying too little, Joe. I'm paying too little. I'm, I'm, yes, you are. I'm blessed yes, to have this man. You're a kind person. Yep, you are. All right, so... Rob, uh, my topic this morning really dovetails, uh, I think, nicely with your first guest, uh, which was the mayor, Kevin Knowles, and the city manager. Uh, and I wanted to focus on, of course, the uh, recent reports of uh, violence, uh, a lot of it gunplay uh, within the city confines, and really want to delve into this issue a little bit more to see, uh, okay, are we happy with the city's response? To these issues and should the public be demanding more i don't set this topic up as a means of, of critiquing uh our city government i think uh by and large everybody seems to be well or at least most people seem to be pretty satisfied how they're doing their jobs but boy we got a problem and i uh, just want to get into it a little bit further and and a statistic that uh, the mayor threw out there kind of concerned me uh, he did issue a press release after the shootings over at uh, Coburn Field last week. And, of course, it brought to mind some other problems we've had, uh, murders on the east side, uh, uh, some, some gunplay down the southern part of the county, a bomb threat that was called into city government. And I was wondering, okay, are we situated well here in Martinsburg to – to deal with these kinds of problems. Uh, and I think we've got a good panel to talk about this. We've got downtown business owners. We've got a, uh, uh, probably the most civic-minded individual I know. We've got lawyers. Uh, we've got a relative newbie uh, and John Gilstrap who can bring an outside perspective to this and what his experiences have been so far. So good panel to discuss it. Uh, what we do know is that nationwide there is a police shortage. Uh, I, 2022 peer-reviewed study by Rice University indicates that since the 1970s, over 500 U.S. towns have completely disbanded their municipal or city police departments. And these are towns from populations of 1,000 up to 200,000 people. 
many of these towns leave policing to county sheriffs and state police now. And, of course, we know in West Virginia they have their own problems with recruiting officers uh, with reported shortages both at the sheriff level and at the state police level. Nationwide, a study by Police Executive Research Form, which is a D.C. think tank, indicates that officer resignations in the last decade are up 47 percent. Retirements are up 19% in the last decade with our police officers. And as the mayor reported, Rob, we were operating in Martinsburg with a shortage of 13 police officers. He indicated now we're down to about six or seven, but still, uh, that's a concerning trend, both nationwide and locally. So what suffers when we don't have uh, adequate police on the street while well, we know response times go down. And uh, that example in the southern part of the county where uh, there was a call in about an intruder and the owner of the home goes to investigate with his gun and ends up uh, shooting and killing the intruder. Uh, you know, th- those are episodes that can play out more and more if our police re- response times are poor. We know that uh, There's been programs in the past. The Night Eyes program with the city of Martinsburg served as a deterrent because there were officers on their bikes and patrolling the streets, and they would leave little stickers on your door of your business saying, hey, we were here last night at 2 a.m. That kind of deterrence is lost if we don't have officers. And, of course, the less emergent calls that the police receive, uh, calls regarding maybe uh, domestic uh, abuse or violence, uh, mental health calls, those go way down the priority list because the police are responding to shootings and, and whatnot. So these are the effects of not having an adequate police force. So, I, again, I offer this not as a critique but a reality of the situation, and what are we going to do about it? So my question this morning really is twofold. One, do we feel, given the panel we have here this morning, that there is a problem in terms of policing in downtown Martinsburg And are the recent shootings just symptomatic of an overall problem? And number two, what do we do about it? As citizens of of the city, should we be demanding that resources be directed more towards recruiting and hiring police officers, raising pay, raising benefits, making the job more attractive so that we can get people in those positions? And should we emphasize that over the other expectations we have of city government, like uh, having a good park system and and having uh, sidewalks and things like that, Uh, enforcement of our building codes. There's a lot of guns versus butter arguments we can make here, but as citizens, given what's happening recently, should we be demanding of our city leaders that they direct resources towards more policing? Those are my questions this morning. Joe, between my intro and your setup, most of the panel is left to go to Barrett Studer's place to get business, except for Bill. Bill's asleep. John, can you wake him up? It's his time. It's his turn. Bill, Bill, Bill. Whoa, 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 whoa. Sorry. No, you're, you're good. I'm just having fun. No, he's not. Believe me, I, I sucked up the first five minutes of the show myself. I'm sorry. Go ahead, and now we go to break. Now we go to break. <laughs> Yeah, my turn, Ron. Yes, okay. sir. I, yeah. We did really need to wake you him up, John. Wake him. <laughs> Hit him again. Uh, Joe, you're making, as always, you're making very good points. And I was sitting here listening, trying to decide how much of a problem do we have? Uh, and I really do not know. I'm not a resident of Martinsburg, so I hear uh, the news on WRNR or the journal occasionally. I do not have my finger on the pulse of what's going on in Martinsburg. But we, you, the point you're making is Martinsburg's not unique. Martinsburg's like every other community in the country. Uh, I know as far as violent crimes, uh, the statistic says it's gone down substantially the last couple of so years. Uh, but you're talking more than just violent crimes. You're talking about a whole host of crimes. Uh, is it worse than what it was 
25, 30 years or so ago? Uh, perhaps it is. Uh, I don't know. Uh, is it a, uh, is what we're seeing a, a spotlight on a few individuals that we tend to magnify and make it much larger than what the issue actually is? Uh, again, I don't know. So I'm having a hard time trying to respond to your question, Joe, because I do not know the scale of the problem in both the absolute or the relative sense. Mr. Hornby? So I was at the game, and I think the city police as well as the county uh, sheriff's department did a fantastic job. There was no panicking. There was no issues. I think the police department as a whole in our city does a fantastic uh, job, and their response time is very adequate. Um, as to your recruiting question, Joe, I mean, who wants to be a cop these days? Uh, with the with the amount of disrespect they get, with the amount of uh, uh, problems they get into, everything they do is scrutinized. Um, it's always becomes a major issue. So, um, you know, who who would want to take that position? Uh, it, it's kind of like the teacher position. You don't get any respect. The pay is not. You can't really get great pay through it. Um, so I, I think it's a it's a societal issue that we need to look at. We need to respect our police officers more. We need to, uh, you know, when they tell you to do something, you do it. I don't care what your rights are. You do it. Until you figure it out, you do it, and then we'll figure the process out later. And well, it's an interesting perspective that you have because you grew up in a dictatorship. I, I mean, and, and that's the thing is – you know, my dad always taught me from a very young age, if a police officer pulls you over, just do what you can because you don't want to be thrown in jail in Africa. Just do do what they tell you, and then we'll figure it out. Or execute it on the street. Or And I've seen that too. Yeah. Mr. Gilstrap. I, this is a, a multifaceted issue, obviously, and we'll pretend it's a presidential debate, and I'll answer the question I, I wanted you to ask. Um, <laughs> Because <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't know a lot about about Martinsburg, but I've written a lot about the the, the police issue. Um, when I lived in in Fairfax, I lived maybe a mile from the police substation in Fairfax, and we had an intruder alarm in our house, like intruder intruder in the house, and it took the Fairfax County Police twenty four minutes to get to my house, and that that clued me into the fact and kind of emphasized the fact that really we are responsible. The, the role of the police is not the protection of people. The role of the police is the prosecution, uh, the, the, the collection of evidence and the prosecution of bad guys, making sure that the bad guys get off the street. They solve crimes. Their role is not to protect People. Well, isn't the motto but, to but, protect and serve? So protect it and is, serve, but yeah. that is not. There are Supreme Court cases that say the police do not have to intervene in ongoing crime. So there's, which is, not, I'm not suggesting vigilanteism here. But what I'm, what I'm suggesting is, I think we put a lot of pressure on the police to do things that they, they really can't be there in 23 seconds. They have to. There, there, there's, there's. Crime happens fast and responses happen slow, even if it's a good response. So what we have lost, I think, is a sense of community where we have these incidents where police are getting beaten up and people take out their phones, their phones where you can actually call someone for help, but they're not calling for help. They're taking videos of people being beaten up. Uh, we've, we've, we've just gone into this weird place in the community where we we celebrate miscreants we we, we celebrate this this level of of violence and we prefer there, there's an element of society that prefers the clicks to actually doing the right thing so do we have a crisis of policing i don't know but some of it if we do quite honestly i mean i, I bleed blue I was emergency responder for a long time, but officer friendly is gone. You know, we've gone from from peace officers to law enforcement officers, and not so much in this area. <clears throat> excuse me, not so much in this area. If you go into Northern Virginia, where I come from, everybody is dressed in the I call it tactical. 
You know, you've got you got the vests. The militarization the, of the police. Yeah, the black on black and the Oakley sunglasses and the stern looks and all of this. Who's going to go up to this person? And, and you know, what kid is going to go up and say, excuse me, I lost my dog? They, they project this element of fear. And th so there, there's, a, there's a cause and effect thing that's happening here. The system is deeply broken. I don't think that's happening in our community. I, I looked at... Uh, like Friday night football game, you got Sheriff Blair throwing the football with an eight-year-old. I would agree. So it's it, different it, here in our community. I, I don't see that. I at agree, a hundred percent. It is different here. But a lot of that arming of the police here. force, what people call the militarization of the police force, took place in the '80s when the drug wars, the uh, crack cocaine violence, became so prevalent that there were so many murders, and the police were pulling out tiny pistols while they were being oh, I just, shot I, at I with put Uzis. It, I put it on Homeland Security money after 9-11, all that well, money. That, that, that escalated it, in. but yeah. the, in the 80s, when I think Washington, D.C. used to have 500-something murders a year uh, at one point during the 80s, and the violence was everyone. You, you weren't safe anywhere because the, the crossfire was catching innocent people on a regular. Let me get Larry Schultz in here before really, yeah. before Really, really quick. I do want to clarify the point. that What I was describing does not, does not apply here. One of the things I love about living here is that it is that much different than where I come from. Uh, John's correct when he talks about, um, you know, when the police say they're here to serve and protect, the way that they protect us is not by being an armed guard escorting us around our life. The way they protect us is by grabbing the bad guys, seeing that they get prosecuted, and seeing that they go to jail. Um, they don't, we tend to think of serve and protect as meaning I'm going to be a guard at your house 24 seven. Anybody comes and tries to cause trouble. He's got a problem with me first. We don't have that here. And it's kind of a good thing. <laughs> I don't think we need that many police. Um, and so, uh, yeah, the difficulty is, um, when there are insufficient controls on the kinds of people who can buy guns and obtain guns and insufficient background checks on the criminal histories of people who want a gun, um, then you're going to have some people with some pretty bad habits packing um, guns. And so there's not much that a local police force can do about those laws. You can't, uh, you know, you're not going to fix that until you fix it on a broader scale. That being said, um, I was concerned about one thing regarding the Martinsburg thing, and it, it's the first time it, it, I've been I've been hearing this for years. It's the first time I ever thought about it. They were saying on the show earlier that they checked out these threats, uh, not with regard to Martinsburg football shooting, but other things. They checked out the threats, and the threats weren't credible. School, the school threats. Yeah. yeah, and I'm always confused by that. Does that mean the guy really wasn't threatening? Or does it simply mean that he made a threat, but the threat was empty? I think it meant that the threat came from out of state and couldn't be credible because he couldn't actually do what he was uh, okay. saying he was going to do. I, I would always like to hear them say, instead of it's not credible, why it's not credible. Yeah. In other words, when I hear that there's a shooter on the loose uh, outside the football stadium that I'm in, I get real nervous, and to allay that fear and call, and keep people protected, um, it would be better to further explain that. I understand why they say, you know, we had the same thing in Morgan County uh, with the schools, and there was a social media threat, and the same announcement was made that the threat's not credible. I didn't know what that meant. Does it mean there was no threat, or there was a threat, but the guy couldn't carry it out? Because the... You know, it's still a crime if you make a threat, I'm even if you don't six, have the 60 ability. seconds, Larry. You got, yeah. you got anything else to add no, to that? I'm good. Joe comes back to you to wrap it up. Well, I, I think uh, one response has to be we need more bodies in the police department. Uh, the shortages that Kevin Knowles refers to is concerning to me. And a growing community, uh, and the fastest growing part of West Virginia, uh, we should not be suffering from a lack of manpower and I, I can see where bodies in off and uniforms can improve the, the relationship between the police department and the community because there's more interactions they're not always stressed about responding to calls they're actually just out there mingling with the community just having a presence and we also know that's a deterrence 
Uh, it deters the bad guys from from congregating and doing things if the, the police are walking our streets and at all hours of the day and night. And again, having a presence there, I think there's benefits to that. So it's going to be a situation where we're going to have to pay for it, folks. Uh, you, you recruit, you got you got to have salaries, got to have benefits. And we're going to have to pay for that to get more people in these uniforms. Joe, thank you. Good start to the program. We are produced by the sports doctor, Colin McLaughlin. He'll be busy with the crew tonight, uh, broadcasting high school football. This segment of the show brought to you in part by CMA Honda, also by the Wagner Law Firm, West Virginia's premier DUI defense attorneys, by elder care attorney Danny Staggers in downtown Martinsburg at 304-267-3915. If you uh, missed... The opening of the program at 8.35. Uh, I will now redo my open. Joe Freddy will redo his. <laughs> and we'll, we'll go to break we'll again. <laughs> finish out the show. Everybody we can relax. Play the tape. <laughs> uh, we are uh, surrounded by a very uh, qualified group of people here. The uh, the mogul, Michael Hornby. Good morning, Rob. New York Times bestselling author, John Gilstrap. Good morning. On the telephone, Joseph Joey Tots Ferretti. Good morning. And attorney at law, Lauren Schultz. Good morning. And with issue number two, the Admiral, Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, Rob, I'm going to go down the path that I thought Joe was going to go down, and he kind of diverted and took a, another uh, another tack. And it's another way Joe's let us down this that's morning. another yes. way he's let us down, yeah. Uh, there was a, a week or so ago, there was another school shooting, and a couple aspects. One, are becoming kind of numb to them. They happen so frequently, except if they're, if they're in your backyard. Uh, but in the, uh, the Georgia case, a, a 14-year-old with a AR-15 uh, killed four four of his uh two of his fellow students and two faculty uh in a school where there were abundance of sros and there and the school was hardened had lockdown procedures uh and georgia's uh legislators response was they're going to consider new policies to foster student mental health and encourage people to safely store guns after school shooting uh that's been kind of the response after every school shooting. Uh, mental health. We, we've got to do something for our mental health. Uh, the only exception I can think of was, was Maine, where they actually put some more rigorous gun control uh, as state policies to address this issue. But Maine has been, I think, one of the exceptions. Um, my question to, the, uh, to our symbol, uh, symbols this distinguished group is if there was a school shooting in West Virginia and a horrendous school shooting, all of them are horrendous, but there's a school shooting in West Virginia, would the state legislators take a more robust and aggressive form of gun control to address this or would they kind of do what Georgia is opting to do? Let's go straight to the legislator in the room, Michael Hornby. So I, I think the question is not if it's when, um, and yeah. yeah. I, I firmly believe the legislature should pass and uh, and fund SROs throughout our uh, throughout our state. Will we pass any kind of gun control? No, we will not. Not not in this legislature. Um, we are very pro Second Amendment. Um, I don't see that as being the answer, uh, Bill. That that's just from me. I, I do think discipline at the. Um, at the family level, parenting as the issue. It is mental health, but it is just bad parenting. Um, and, and in that case in Georgia, that was a bad parent and he's been held accountable. Um, so, so that's kind of where, where I think, but I think the, the role of the legislature is to fund SROs now. That is a way to deter um, any future school shooting, in my opinion. John, John Gilstrap. It's interesting we talk about the one in, in, in Georgia, and I'm thinking, is this the one with the, the guy whose father gave him the gun? Yes. Which, which is sort of, it, it, it's part of the question, right? It, do we, there are enough of them <coughs> that I get them mixed up, and, that, and that's sad. But in that case, this particular kid had been approached by the FBI for making credible threats, and dad covered for him, and then dad gave him a rifle for Christmas, and he used that rifle to go shoot up the school. I don't know that there is any level of gun control that can get between that level of, of 
irresponsibility. Um, so the problem with gun control in general is it it punishes the people who aren't doing anything wrong. It controls the people who aren't doing anything wrong, and the people who are doing things wrong don't pay any attention to it. Uh, so if you look at the crime rates, getting this, moving just briefly right from the school issue, uh, the highest crime rates are in the, in the uh, cities with the, the greatest levels of gun control. So uh, guns for the vast majority of people are for protection. It's, they're not assault weapons. They're not, they're, not, they're not assault weapons with, in the sense that you don't, it's not a weapon to assault people. It's their personal protection weapons. Um, you can require that they be locked up. I think it's irresponsible if you've got little kids in a house not to have a locked up weapon. But if you've got all adults in the house, I think it's kind of stupid to have a bunch of locked up weapons if your purpose is to defend against people coming into your home. So it's, this is not, a, I don't, the school shooting issue is not something that can be solved by legislating the weapons. There, there is something, again, I said in the last segment, there's something broken in society. And part of it is, not going to specifics, I, I, I think we all know somebody in our lives who we know is a, a little bit off. And if we heard that, well, he just went and shot up a place, we'd go, well, that's not really all that much of a surprise. But the mechanism doesn't exist for us to go forward and say, you know, Mr. Policeman, you need to take a look at this guy. And maybe it shouldn't exist because it's, you, you have a right to be crazy. So it's, I, I think it's a huge issue. I, I don't have a solution for it, Bill. Mr. Schultz. Yeah, but if you're armed and crazy, there is a problem. Yes. And you better get on that problem before he shows up at the school. <laughs> but but, uh, but you don't take away the... You don't take how do you identify it, Larry? I mean, at what well, point do you identify it? What, what part of crazy? I mean, well, okay, th that's for, the problem, right? For example, when there are threats, and like in this Georgia case, you go to that house with the police and a warrant, and you take the guns so that... We're, we're not going to have your kid with an arsenal threatening the community. We're taking the guns. It's not just that, well, we didn't really think he was going to carry it out, because that's what you hear every single time that a bunch of children are dead. So do you, and, do you take the gun from the parent then? Yes. And, and Even the though the you, parent hasn't done anything? Well, except to raise this kid who makes credible threats on social media. Right. And oh, I'm not uh, saying you know. that parent was right by giving the gun. I'm just saying <laughs> no. before when the FBI came to them, what did they really, what were their resources to do? Well, they're they going to lock the kid up? They're going to like, take the guns from the parent? I, I, that's what I would suggest we need legislation to enable the police to do. If your 13, 14-year-old son is making threats to use the gun if i hear that threat and my kid is in that school that's a credible threat whether the family has guns or not because now i've got to spend my time wondering is this kid going to show up with a gun that he got from home or from his buddy or from somebody else uh, it's just you want to talk about the erosion of our education system imagine being a school teacher or a little kid and having to live with this notion that at any moment somebody could kick the door open and shoot everybody. So we 20, don't have that in courthouses. So we 20, 25 that. years ago, there were guns in the back of pickup trucks in Morgan County and in sure. Berkeley County, and we didn't have this issue. So what has changed between now and then, in uh, your opinion? I think the ownership of guns has become much uh, broader. In other words, more people in the community now have guns, including some, plus our mental health problems due to the collapse of the middle class are skyrocketing. And whose fault is that, and, well, well, the collapse <laughs> of the middle class is Ronald Reagan's yeah, fault, I, but that's okay. I, I, uh, <laughs> I've been holding back going to rebuttal because I thought it's all right, we're going to take turns as opposed to the... I own the yeah. place, Bill. <laughs> okay. Well, but... We got to get Joe involved too. Got to get Joe involved. <laughs> Joe, go right ahead. Well, I, I, to, to John Gilstrap's argument that the problem with gun regulation and gun control is that it punishes the innocent uh, who own guns and do nothing wrong. I, I mean, that could be applied to business regulations. The problem with business regulations is it punishes businesses who don't do anything wrong. 
but yet they have to follow federal regulations because other businesses can't be trusted. I mean, that applies across a lot of of aspects in our society regarding how we regulate things. And the bottom line here is I I am dismayed to hear from Mike Hornby that he expects our government at the state level to do nothing with regard to uh, the the threats that our schools face every day. Uh, Look, we know that we can't intervene. We're not in the era of precogs and, and anticipating crime and intervening before crime actually occurs. But we, we do know that there has to be accountability. And that's what the issue is in Georgia. The parent who saw fit to give a child a Christmas toy, an AR, six months after he was investigated by the FBI, that parent is going to be held accountable. Half the states in this country have gun storage laws which require people to secure their guns. Nobody's taking them. Nobody's telling them what they can do with them except except store them safely so youngsters whose minds aren't fully developed can't get their hands on them. That's accountability. That's all that is. And I would hope our state legislature would look at what I think up to 26 states have done regarding just requiring owners to be safe and secure with their guns. The, the business regulation argument is 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 terrible because it's not in the Constitution, Joe. I think that's the big difference um, when it comes to to guns. And but Mike, I, I, you're, you're defining gun, you're defining gun control way too broadly. And, and I'm not I mean, taking a personal for, stance on this. I'm just letting you know I don't think the legislature would do anything. I'm just, I'm just, I don't Mike, think, keep in mind when you disagree with Joe, he is an advertiser, yes. and he pays regularly. <laughs> and a, and, and a friend, mind. I understand. <laughs> keep that in mind. More so the advertising aspect of it. Okay. Bill, what about, yeah. Okay, uh, Mike Hornby, I can uh, accept the fact, and I honor your opinion, that the legislature is not going to do anything. Uh, I think that's an honest answer. On gun control. On gun control. But what bothers me is we put everything at the foot of parenting. That may well be right. A lot of go, but that is an excuse for doing nothing, and that argument bothers me a great deal. You're looking for a reason of not to do nothing, and you fall back on par- poor parenting. Well, in in the case of the Georgia case, what else can you say? There, there is no law that you could have passed that could have prevented that, except for saying that was a bad choice by that parent. To give his son. And four people are dead. And four people are dead. But that parent is to blame. And four people are dead. If that parent, instead of giving his son an AR, had bought him a three-quarter ton Ford pickup truck, and the kid drove it at age 14 and killed four people, Mm -hmm. there would be a little thing called insurance in place to at least give a measure of justice to the families of the dead. We don't allow that for guns. And that's ridiculous. If you own guns and you're a responsible person, you should have to have liability insurance that covers that. But in most of the homeowner's policies, it's absolutely excluded. And uh, so there's there's no protection whatsoever for the victims. It will cost money, as anybody who's paid their insurance on anything recently will notice. uh, The rates have shot up. But um, it's not too much to ask that at least... There be some financial responsibility, not just we're going to put the dad in jail for the rest of his life. That's great, but there's four tombstones out there. But isn't isn't it possible that this becomes so? I, I think that the local governments in this case are are starting the process of regulating the issue through arresting the parents. There's a case in I think it was in Virginia where the little kid brought the the gun to school mm-hmm. and shot the teacher in the parent or the, in the in the hand and the parent was then arrested for that. We've got this right. guy being arrested in, and, in and this Mich- case and Michigan and, and in Michigan. Michigan. So if in fact what we do what we see is the parents actually being held criminally responsible for the actions of their kids, then this becomes a perhaps a self regulating issue. Well, at that point, of course, then the insurance would be cheaper. But in the meantime, (laughs) right? Because everybody's regulating themselves. Uh, What I would do is both, right? And and make sure that the insurance is in place so that these families don't get to say, you know, well, thanks for your thoughts and prayers, but how am I supposed to pay my mortgage? 
Um, you know, used to be that a school teacher could buy a house on their own. They can't do that anymore. It takes two salaries uh, to buy a mortgage. And, and so these two people are dead. What are they going to get? Workers comp? Are we kidding ourselves here? I mean, the actual level of justice that's being meted out here has nothing to do with the constitutional perfect protection of, of arms. It has everything to do with somebody not wanting guns to cost too much money because, after all, they won't buy so many if they do cost too much. Is it legal for a 14-year-old to no. own and operate an AR-15? No. 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 Not, in, well, not in most states. Well, I don't know about West Virginia. No. <laughs> a- so there's no, there's no law that you can pass then that stops a there, there's no law that kid we, from getting one. That we could have passed that would have stopped this. Well, I'll tell you what. Illegally. You know, it's, it's, as a Second Amendment purist myself, in just at first blush, not having really thought this through except in the last five minutes, I think the legislation to hold parents accountable for however you define the gun violation for, for minor children, I, that's, that's fine legislation. That doesn't even touch the Second Amendment. It does hold count, uh, parents accountable for their actions, which, for the children's actions, and, and that's kind of what we expect them to do anyway. I think that's, that's a really great route to go. We need to move on to issue number three, and for that we go to Delegate Michael Hornby in the Michael Hart seat. Yeah, so I was listening to uh, Chris Anders yesterday, and he, he brought up a couple of uh, points that I th- been thinking about for the last 24 hours. And if you don't know, Chris Anders is running for the House of Delegates as Republican in the 97th John Hardy seat. And and it got me questioning, I look at the state of West Virginia, we we take about $15 billion in federal funds, and we we generally have revenue of about $5 billion. What is the role of state government in, in our state? What is the role? We can talk about lowering taxes, but what is the role of state government within West Virginia? That's my question to the panel today. All right, let me start on the telephone first with Joe Ferretti. Joseph? Well, I I mean, the one way to eat an elephant is with small bites. So I'm going to take your question, Mike, and and just direct it at one aspect of state government, which I think is central and vital for uh, the state of West Virginia and all 50 states, and that is education. Uh, the state has a requirement to educate its population, to put people out there in the workforce who are going to be successful and maybe someday come back and invest in their home state or at least represent West Virginia well nationwide. So I, I think uh, having a, a State Department of Education, I know that's a real uh, matter of debate in Charleston, but I, I think you need to have somebody overseeing all of the uh, moving parts regarding state education. And now that we have created a parallel highway of schools, being charter schools, private schools, and homeschooling, I think it's even more imperative now that the State Department of Education be involved to monitor and make sure these students are making progress, that they're turning in their assessments if they're being homeschooled, which is not happening, and and that we're able to say that we are graduating students who are able to take on the world. Uh, That is a central role of state government. That's one aspect of it, but I think that's probably the most important in my mind. All right. Good start, Joe. Mr. Stubblefield. Yeah, I think this is in the eyes of the beholder to a large degree. From my perspective, I think the state government should be promoting the well-being of our citizens, promote our economy, promote our health. You can do that through a lot of different ways. Uh, they promoting the economy, roads. We have to have roads that are essential uh, for if unless we remain static or move back uh, uh, to yesteryear. Uh, child welfare, corrections. So there's a whole list of things and this kind of harkens back to the discussion you and I had the other day uh, Mike the uh, uh, reducing taxes uh, plays well in the political sense and it is something that resonates going to reduce your taxes but in the long-term benefit of our of our well-being of the state is that the best way to best approach to take. I personally think we have a responsibility to promote the well-being of our state, and that is being done through a series of actions. Uh, it could be promoting the economy, the infrastructure, uh, edu- education, our health. So, Mr. Schultz? A person's education is what permits them, in most cases, especially in West Virginia, 
to escape the burdens of poverty and a broken home. Um, their education, that's the tool that the state can give our children to become successful taxpayers, <laughs> which is in all of our interests as time goes on. Um, one of the problems, of course, that West Virginia has is when a child here in a lot of places, not so much Martinsburg, I don't suppose, but in Morgan County, when a child is grown up and gets a good education at a good college, um, they leave. Often they leave the state forever um, because in places, rural towns, this isn't just a West Virginia thing. Springfield, Ohio had it too, I think. Uh, they were yeah. raising them up and educating them well. And then the kids said, okay, unfortunately, there's no opportunities here to do anything but very hard physical work. And that ain't what I went to college for. And so I'm going to go to a state that's growing. So isn't that why we invest in economic development and invest in these companies coming in? It is. So that, they, that our biggest export stays in West Virginia? <laughs> yes, it is. But th you have to do a great job with the education or none of it's going to matter. In other words, if, if you grow the businesses, but the kids are still leaving the state for whatever reason, or they're not very well educated, those kids won't be able, those adults, when they become adults, will not be able to serve these new industries, and the new industries will falter for a lack of people. And then you, you get the Springfield, Ohio thing where they say, our, our businesses are going broke. Our, our people can't do it. Um, so they bring in the Haitian refugees, and now they're making fun of them and, and making cruel, racist taunts. Um, it, it's not a good thing. Mm. We need to We need to educate our children that is if not the number one almost the number one thing that this state has to do and they got to do it better than they're doing it now mr gilstrap wants to be heard he's meowing go ahead <laughs> uh, when you when you say state government do you mean state and local government do you mean state, state versus local? state government. okay because i i push education uh elementary education down to the local level i, I don't think that's that should be at the state level i think higher education is certainly a state level uh program I agree on, on the roads. I think the, the state should concentrate on, on big picture issues and, and stay largely out of people's lives. I, I, don't, I don't believe in, in large state governments. Um, as, as taxes go up, it just it, it, it feeds on itself. You end up with, with bloated programs that don't necessarily accomplish a lot. I think the State Department of Education, as, as we've had it on this show over and over again, I see it as the source of the education problem. You have these, these huge appointment terms of bureaucrats in Charleston that run everything and make take a lot of the local power away and i think that's largely the, the source of our education problems across the state from from county to county and i think that's indicative of the problem with top-down um governance mr hornby you have one minute to wrap it up so we have uh has this has joe ferretti responded joe started he started oh did he i'm sorry uh, My and, and i agree with education but we we do throw in 2.2 billion dollars to our educational system every single year and it seems like it doesn't matter how much money we throw at the education system, it doesn't seem to raise the test scores or make any difference. So um, for me, I, I kind of agree with John. I think it, it's it's to deregulate um, and to do big picture items and stay out of l local. So you kind of agree with Mr. Anders then? Uh, it, it, I do in, in, in a small way. But I do think there is a role for government to, uh, I mean, I'd love to see no income tax. So would you go as far as to say you and Anders are in lockstep the way you think? <laughs> I think Chris is very smart. I don't think we're in lockstep, though. <laughs> Would you say of all the legend people running for office, you agree with Mr. Andrews most? Of any of the people I agree with for me the most. I'm running for office. <laughs> That's today's answer. Yeah. <laughs> very nice. It's uh, Mr. Schultz who is on the clock next. And uh, then Mr. Gilstrap wraps up the uh, final half hour of the program and the... I don't usually use the anthem as bumper music. However, when it is the birthday of the anthem, you got to make an exception. It was, ladies and gentlemen, on this date, 
1814, a turning point in the War of 1812, the British fail to capture Baltimore. During the battle, Francis Scott Key composes his poem, Defense, with a C, of Fort McHenry, which is later set to music and becomes the United States National Anthem, 210 years ago today. Uh, also, uh, speaking of wars, 1862, during the Civil War, Union soldiers find a copy of Robert E. Lee's battle plans in a field outside Frederick, Maryland. It is a prelude to the Battle of Antietam, which we discussed earlier this week with Dr. Stephen A. Goldman. And if you haven't had a chance to do the Antietam battlefield tour, don't waste another day. Do it. it it's marvelous. And a couple of things with the Antietam battlefield. Not only the tour is very impressive, but the uh, candlelight tour in early yes. December. Uh, a long line, so you have to wait for the long lines, but it is worth the wait. It's magnificent. But the but I'm sorry they did the uh, they stopped the candlelight. Uh, excuse me, the the tour, the walking tour, mm -hmm. uh, on the birthday of the battle. That was uh, one of the most moving experiences I've I've, I've ever had. So. With issue number four, Mr. Lawrence Schultz. Uh, given the time limitations, I'm going to kind of uh, shorten this preamble. But everyone will remember who Carl Rove was. He was the uh, deputy chief of staff and a, a political consultant for uh, George W. Bush during his presidency 20 years ago. Also served in the Clinton administration for a while. He did, did for a little while. Best um, president ever. So um, he's pulled no punches in his uh, comments on the debate. He says it was a train wreck for Donald Trump. He says that the uh, debate performance by Trump was catastrophic and goes so far as to say that he was crushed by a woman he previously dismissed as dumb as a rock. And the simple question is, do you agree with Mr. Rove? Well, first off, I'm shocked Larry would choose an anti-Trump topic. To, to, <laughs> Somebody's got to hold up the flag, man. <laughs> to the show? <laughs> the anniversary of the national anthem, he's holding up the flag? Why do you care what Paul Rose says, <clears throat> Larry? Why is that important? Well, <laughs> he spent his whole life lying to do us. You, now that he finally you, tells the truth, I'm heartened <laughs> by so, it. So you respect <laughs> Paul Rose so much? I mean, I know you worked for the, the <clears throat> best president ever because George W. Bush did make me a citizen. But I, I don't think it was a train wreck. I, I think Trump was Trump. Has the appeal period run on that, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a citizen, baby. You can't take it back. <laughs> I can't run for president. but Since you let off, keep on going, Michael. Uh, no, I I watched the debate. I thought Trump was Trump. I, I thought his clothes was good. He did take every piece of bait that uh, she threw at him. In, especially the crowd size thing that that was uh, that was a piece of red meat she threw out there and he just couldn't he couldn't hold back um, I don't think he did himself uh, any disservice or any I don't think it changed the right or the left uh, I, she went up one percentage point I mean, in approval rating after that a lot of people watched um, I don't think any independents or any unswayed expected anything more from Donald I mean he is always been Donald and I've always been a supporter and I will still vote for him even if he tanked even worse um, so I don't I don't think your summation is accurate I don't believe Mr. Rowe. Short short of the, the epic Biden disaster that was the first debate I don't know that there are winners in these things because I've yet to watch one in the last 20 something years when someone's actually answered a question that was asked of them uh, nobody, Bob, Harris didn't a answer any of the questions that she was at. Even the first one to open up the debate, she deflected. She didn't answer that one either. So I don't know how you find a winner in a debate. Yeah, like even, that. even when they try to go after her, yeah. she, she wouldn't answer. One of the analysts before this debate. Bill, why don't you go next? Uh, <laughs> thank you, Rob. I will. <laughs> one of the analysts before the debate made the suggestion that they need to put the question on the screen and leave it on the screen the whole time to remind the audience 
the question was not being answered. You're exactly right, Mike. Neither one answered the question. They're very skilled in doing this. As John mentioned much earlier, I'm going to answer the question I want you to ask me rather than the question you ask me. That could be addressed in large part if the question was stated on the screen and left on the screen. But going back to the other point that, uh, that Mike, uh, I think, rebutted, I do think it made a difference. We're not going to see the big swings that one of the, uh, one of the debates a few years or so ago a 16 point swing we don't have the margin now for a 16 point swing one of two percent is going to be comparable to what we had a few years ago with that and it's going to be not so much the swing as what demographics are going to get engaged and will actually vote i think two things happen uh, Tuesday night that would be significant and that is going to be that Harris was talking to the younger population uh, Taylor Swift shortly after that supported Harris now we as our age can dismiss this but Bill don't go bringing me up to your okay, age okay yeah <laughs> so, but I was looking you are Mike, too old Mike, for Taylor Mike, Swift Mike though. Hornby was shaking his head <laughs> Mike, well uh, yeah but let me finish Mike let me Mike Hornby, uh, so uh, shaking his head but there is something like three or four hundred thousand young folks that have said they are going to get out and vote. Whether they will or not, I don't know. But this is the group that's going to make or break the election. So you cannot dismiss Tuesday as uh, as being a non-event. Mr. Ferretti. Well, uh, I think the debate to those five or six percent of people who uh, reportedly have not made up their mind yet I think the debate was damaging to Trump because it was a reminder that he, his base instincts is not to listen to his advisors, which to my mind has always been the danger represented by Trump. Uh, this was borne out by uh, books that were written after his administration. Uh, you know, the defense secretary saying that he asked if protesters could be shot by the National Guard in Lafayette Square. Uh, John Bolton wrote that he was a whisker away from pulling the United States out of NATO. Those kinds of instincts w with Trump are dangerous and they're wrong. And I'm sure, as I'm sitting here, that his advisors told him how to conduct that debate and he refused to do it. That has always been the danger of Donald Trump. And he doesn't listen to anyone. He's never listened to anyone because he's only ever worked for himself and his father. Uh, so I, I think that to the independent voter out there who is still making up their mind, I think it is a signal that what we remembered about him and his administration four years ago is the danger is still present and it could move people to not vote for him. It might move people just not to show up. It might move people to vote for Harris. But I think that is the danger for Trump coming out of that debate. Mr. Gilstrap. OK, roll the tape for the open here. I agree. It's with rolling, Larry. baby. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it was disastrous for um, for Trump. I don't know that it'll move the needle um, because you know it, 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 there's 12 people in the United States that haven't really made up their minds on on this already. I thought he made the critical mistake. He clearly underestimated his opponent. He said at one point during the debate that she's doing a terrible job in the debate. He criticized her debate performance during the debate, and she was eating his lunch. Uh, and you are a Trump supporter. Correct? I am a Trump supporter. And and I, I still am, but I was embarrassed by his inability to create a cogent argument. He would get flustered. He rose to every, every nibble of bait that was thrown out for him. And once he gets flustered, he just, he doesn't construct a good debate argument and then he you could tell he got mad that whole you talk about size matters with trump you know and and once they got into the the people were leaving the 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 uh, his his rallies um that clearly and i forget what point was buried in the middle of that there was a, a legitimate point and then she threw in the crowd size and then that's that's the only thing he talked about so I don't think it has a, a has a big effect one way or the other in the debate because th there's only a few votes in a few counties that was going to decide the outcome of of this election. I don't think it attracted a single new voter for Trump. 
Um, I don't know. I don't think Harris's performance. I thought her. She was cartoonish, and uh, I think she was blessed with questions that were very kind and didn't didn't address any of the issues I wanted them to ask her. I mean, it's not that she didn't ask, answer the questions that were asked, but they didn't ask the questions I wanted to hear, like justifying what she talked about in 2019, all that super left wing stuff that she says she's walked away from. None of that came into the debate. So they did <clears> ask her about the border, though. They, they, but, and, and she didn't address and that she, either. She and affected, asked, she'd affected she, every question yeah. that and, was asked. But she it. asked about fracking as well. So there were questions yeah, that, yeah. Uh, that she didn't uh, answer any of those right. questions. Well, nor did nor did Trump. No, nor no, no. Trump, I, it's both, right. both um, the same so, thing. So the point I'm trying to make there is I don't I, I think Harris's performance was was not a good one, but by comparison, it was it, 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 she did a lot better. Larry, wrap and, it up. And, yeah, I heard a demographer on television not too long ago. I've not fact checked this, saying that since the 2016 election, 16 million baby boomers have died. I'm um, sorry to say that for those of us well, that was who are in that group, <laughs> wow. but they have been replaced on the voter rolls. Uh, believe it or not. And um, they were replaced with younger people. And I would also note uh, for this group of men uh, <laughs> sitting here uh, that, of course, if you take a random sample of people of a certain age who pass away, most of them are men <laughs> because women on average live longer than men. In this country, I believe it so, evens out eventually. But, yeah, I mean, well, eventually, <laughs> yes, it well, does. basically fifty. But when you take sixteen million out in eight years, there's a slight majority of men, I would think. So, um, anyway, where we end up is when those voters get replaced, they're not being replaced with older people; they're being replaced with younger people, uh, eighteen-year-olds, people who turned eighteen in the last eight years, are joining the voter rolls, and. Over time, once you live long enough, this becomes an issue you can look at. Over time, what is going on with the younger voters in their minds? What do they want? Because that's replacing what the 16 million wanted. And over time, that's going to have an effect on older candidates and candidates who have certain <clears throat> positions. It will be very interesting to see. I don't know how much effect this debate had. I even was kind of surprised at the sort of vacuous nature of the answers that, that Trump gave. So I'm agreeing with John. That's uh, chapter two. Um, um, uh, I was sort of surprised at how easily he wandered off the topic and how the thing about Springfield, Ohio ever came up. I will never know. I cannot imagine any of his advisors saying, well, this would be a good point for you to bring up. <laughs> but you're not uh, going to let him forget it either, Blake. You're darn right. <laughs> <laughs> you can take comfort in the fact, uh, in regards to this voter turnover, Larry, that uh, only 17% of Berkeley Countyans bother to vote, or 6% yeah. in the city. So you don't really have to worry about <laughs> that in Berkeley let, County. Let I'll, me go back to Ives' point that I made <laughs> earlier. I think that Taylor Swift is going to have more of an impact, not all the numbers, but on the margin than people are willing to recognize. Bill, you need to understand the rules. When Larry wraps it up, the point is over. Just because you're an admiral, you don't get to keep going. He wants but, the free tickets. Yes. <laughs> That's right. All right. Issue number five, Mr. Gilstrap. All right. I stumbled over. Uh, I, you know, the Internet takes you to odd places. And so I, I got those places. Anyway. Um, we got virus software on these computers now? <laughs> I, st I stumbled into an Axios uh, article that, that shows that in 2013, 85% of Americans who were aged in, in the 18 to 29 year old age group in, in 2013, 85% reported themselves to be extremely or very proud to be Americans. In 2023, that same, and the, and the poll came from. Um, uh, Oh, shoot, I wrote it down, now I forget. The, the, Axios. Uh, uh, yes, yeah. thank you. Oh, it's right here. Um, in 2023, that same poll showed that 18% of that demographic were <clears throat> extremely or very proud to be Americans. And I'm just curious, I want to throw it out to, to the group here, what do you think happened? Yeah, you, you brought this up earlier when we had the conversation. I told you my neighbor, when his kid graduated from college two years ago, in a conversation, blurted out, America sucks. 
and we started talking about the attitude of a kid that age and why they would say that. Larry Schultz? Yes. Um, I don't have any particular great insight as to why that number would have changed. It's such a sweeping change that I would at first want to see their data and how they r- arrived at this. But assuming that that's uh, appropriate, um, th- then the question is, how did they get what experiences in their life did they have since 2013 that moved them in this way? Uh, 2013 was what the start of the second Obama administration, right? Right, and um, um, then no, 2000 halfway through, halfway through the second Obama. Okay, yeah. well, there's a year into it anyway. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So then um, we we had Trump, then we had Biden. And um, it could just be that those young people, their general feeling is, these guys are too old. <laughs> I don't want them in here. And that goes back to my other point about the, the loss of the baby boomers in the last eight years. Mr. Hornby? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I look at it from a different perspective. I think, Rob, you had a couple of good points when, when you discussed this. Um, but I, I look at this from the point of w- what we're teaching in colleges, and I look at the campuses of colleges um, <coughs> and the protests they're having, supporting a terrorist uh, organization, um, and they've they've been taught that you know Israel is is inherently bad, and, and I think there's a lot of these youngsters that are overstaying their their student visas. I think we have a lot of uh, immigrants who haven't come here legally um, or the right way and put in the the time. When I came to the United States, I had 10 years. I couldn't be arrested. Uh, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't take any assistance whatsoever. Um, and I had to pay my taxes, earn my way, and take a test to get, to get my citizenship. It cost my family a lot of uh, resources to get here. Um, so I'm very proud to be an American. I think my kids are, and I instill that in, in my kids, the family values that we have. And I think we, we, we take it for granted in this country. We, we have a lot of issues here, but we don't have the issues that third world nations in Africa have. We're not seeing people burnt you know, with a tie around their neck every single day in the streets. Uh, we're not getting taxed 85%. We don't have the government taking over businesses or taking over farms. Um, so I think we forget that what we have is very, very special. And, and us being able to talk and disagree, Larry, you and I can disagree, that is a blessing. In most countries, we don't get to do that. We don't get to talk publicly about our president or our government. That just doesn't happen. I think. Sometimes we just need to remind our kids how special this country is. Joe Ferretti. Well, it, it, it all, I think the comments so far are, are referencing this. It all comes back to education and the fact that we're not uh, doing a good job teaching our history. And we're not doing a good enough job teaching that you can be patriotic and still want to improve your country. You can still call out the problems like they did uh, in colonial times uh, and how uh, bloody that was in terms of manifest destiny and how we struggled dealing with white supremacy and how we've tried to remedy that. Uh, you know, it, it, we always strive for a more perfect union. You can still be patriotic and say, we've got a long way to go to get to a more perfect union. Uh, but you, you got to go about it the right way. You got to do it with, with your mind full of, of the history of this country and understanding where we've come from and where we can go. Uh, and, and not show up at a, a town square and desecrate our, our national symbols and burn the flag. That's not going to be persuasive. You're not going to get your point across. Uh, so I, I think it all begins with education and the void that we have to deal with now in education. Because when that void exists, nature tells us uh, you fill a vacuum. And what's happening is, and, and this just happened last week, federal indictment in Tennessee a Tennessee-based far right-wing influencer group received $10 million from Russian state television to broadcast basically how great it is in Russia and China and these other authoritarian countries. Uh, those, those countries uh, do not have benign problems. They have deep-seated problems where their citizens are subjected to all kinds of restrictions and, and certainly don't enjoy liberty. 
uh, that has to be taught. So we've got to learn where we've come from and where we can go. And we have to understand that these other the, the information that we're being bombarded with by these other countries now that are taking advantage of a poorly educated society, we have to understand how to combat that, and you do that with education. John, what was the age group in that survey? 18 to 29. And and this was done in what year? 2013 and 2023. And what has coincided an explosion along those same 11 years? I believe that would be social media. And well, in where is social media targeted age group-wise? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Bill, don't we, get frustrated when I talk. No, no. no. But we, yeah. <laughs> I'm allowed to. I, 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 restarted, I started re researching this last night. We had folks over for dinner, and we used John's question for a very lively, engaged discussion. There were three points that emerged. One was from a teacher that said the students as a whole do not focus as much as they did she used lack of uh, of a moral compass compass uh second rule was a second point was uh given by a, t uh, a technocrat and he picked up exactly what you're saying rob that TikTok and uh uh twitter came into influence at that time and this age group does it i would add a third group or i did add a third group and that was our public leaders at that time donald trump came into office and unlike his predecessors he did not speak well of his predecessors he did not speak well of anyone except those people supporting him there was a negative flavor that was introduced for the first time our folks look up to our national leaders and they see this negative conspiracy so i think those three made a contribution john bill ate up your final thought on well, your subject well i didn't have so. very much to start with <laughs> <laughs> we got final thoughts eight seconds of peace next Thoughts. We started the phone with you, Joe Ferretti. Well, as a pit grad, I hate to say this, but WBU is coming home with a victory on Saturday. Oh, Larry Schultz. A good friend of mine has young children, tells them, every, asks them every day when they come home, who did you help today? I think it's a great question. Bill Stubblefield. I'm going to concede my last four seconds to John Gilstrap to make up for it. I, I think I just should vamp here for 16 seconds. <laughs> and then uh, everybody have a good weekend. Mr. Hornby. Hi, I hope you're feeling better. That's all I got. Thank Go Bulldogs. <laughs> thank you for filling in, Michael. Thank you for filling in, John. Bill, Larry, and Joe, thank you as always. The Dave Ramsey Show is next. This is Talk Radio. Dave Aaron on Martinsburg and TV 10, and we'll talk to you again in 70 short hours. It's 5 o'clock somewhere.